The Japanese video game industry is world famous, contributing to the nation's standing as the third largest economy in the world. But is something dark lurking beneath their perfect looking facade? Japan has enjoyed success in steel, tech, science, and automobiles. Though one of their biggest exports comes by way of entertainment, the video game industry has provided Japan with opportunities to ship their culture and improve their image overseas. In keeping with tradition, Japanese companies innovated on technology that was already in use elsewhere. Of course, with a little of their secret sauce, they were able to wildly succeed where others were seeing massive failure. What was in that secret sauce, you might ask? Well, it could be the fact that Japanese companies routinely work their employees to death. That's actually not a metaphor. Japanese employees often work so many hours at the office that they fall ill and die. It's gotten so bad and happened so often that they had to add a new word to their language to describe the phenomenon of death by work. The word karoshi gained traction in the 1980s and has become a regular in news headlines ever since. According to the National Defense Council for Victims of Karoshi, more than 10,000 workers die from work-related cardiovascular diseases each year. Though admittedly, the number of official claims and court settlements is much lower. This is definitely a contributing factor in Japan's extremely high suicide rate. NHK, Japan's largest news broadcaster, reports often on the changes that Japan needs to make in order to avoid karoshi. However, in October of 2017, little more than a week after publishing this article decrying yet another karoshi victim, NHK revealed that in 2013, one of their own employees died of karoshi after working 159 hours of overtime in a single month. This problem runs incredibly deep. So deep, in fact, that when companies try to amend their policies to alleviate the stress on their employees, they're met with resistance from traditionalists who take the old adage, hard work is its own reward, a little too seriously. It's not just the companies that are liable, it's the consumers as well. To meet the demand of the consumers, companies drive their workers, and the government stands by for the tax revenue. Occasionally, when things get a little out of hand, for example, people are dying, the government or the consumers will blame the company and force the CEO to resign. But then it's right back to business as usual. It's easy to point the finger, it's harder to look in the mirror. Are corporations so greedy, or are the consumers, those desperate for the wants of their heart to be inexpensive and readily available? the greedy ones. It's a team effort to be sure, but it's important to recognize that each step in this process, the consumers, the corporations, the government, all bear a heavy portion of the responsibility when workers' livelihoods are diminished and many are overworked to the point of death. In the video game industry, many current and former employees have spoken out about the harsh treatment they received while developing some of your favorite games. People like Keiji Inafune, designer and producer of the Mega Man series at Capcom, Koichi Nakamura, director of several Dragon Quest games at Enix, and many other developers talked about how hard it was and how much was physically required of them in order to finish what they were working on. Stories range from a tyrannical boss who was impossible to please to employees regularly going three or four days without sleep, even to programmers being locked inside of a room and not allowed out until they had finished coding their project. All in all, there is some seriously troubling history behind the development of some of the most influential video games that have come out of Japan. John Shishapaniak, the author of The Untold History of Japanese Game Companies, has compiled a list of video game employees who were forced to work under extreme circumstances on a blog post for the website Gamasutra. He discovered the use of what is referred to as the Hamachi, or crunch room. According to Tokihiro Naito, developer of Hydalide, when you enter the room, the door was locked from the outside. Sometimes they'd throw a programmer in there, lock the door, and say, we'll let you out once you've finished your coding. Yasuo Yoshikawa of T and Esoft said, I never went home for six months, working and sleeping in the Hamachi room. One Sunday, I went home, took a bath, went to sleep, and when I woke up, I was blind. I was terrified. Someone took me to the hospital because I couldn't see anything. The doctor said it was not a condition young people are supposed to get, so I was ordered to take rest from work. 
Turns out, most developers have a crunch room. This is, of course, not to be confused with the isolation rooms I mentioned in my video about the video game industry's ties to the Yakuza. Isolation rooms, like the ones used by Sega, Sony, Panasonic, Hitachi, Toshiba, and many others, are essentially solitary confinement prison cells. Empty rooms that employees would be locked in for long periods of time either as punishment or as a means to get them to resign without severance benefits. Some employees reported coming into work every day for months straight and spending the entire workday in an isolation room. After a hundred or so such days, most employees would become so disheartened and depressed that they would give in and quit the company. In 2016, the awful business practices of Konami came to light. They began monitoring how much time employees were taking on lunch breaks and shaming those who stayed out too long in public announcements. The cameras in Konami's office aren't meant for security, but to constantly monitor the staff as they work. Employees' email addresses are routinely changed to random letters and numbers every few months. When one employee leaves the company, Konami monitors their related social media posts and reshuffles other employees who like or favorite them within the company. People who aren't seen as useful get reassigned as janitors and factory workers, presumably to get them to resign, similar to the function of an isolation room. Konami is gaining a reputation as a black company. Black companies are known in Japan for having a high rate of harassment, unpaid overtime, extended work hours, discrimination, and short-term employee contracts. The government has posted a list of hundreds of black companies with the likes of Dentsu and Panasonic topping it off. These companies have become well known for their poor treatment of employees and even inspired the annual Black Corporation Awards. One interesting side note is that the winner of the award for 2017 was actually 7-Eleven. It appears as though even foreign companies when moving to Japan quickly adapt to the local customs. Black companies are, of course, not to be confused with dark companies like Hyde, who have worked on games like the Final Fantasy, Yakuza, and Persona series, yet have never been credited for their work. Some Japanese companies, in order to maintain the illusion that they themselves made the entire game that you're playing, will pay smaller companies upfront for their work, but not offer them any credit. These smaller companies are considered dark because they help make the games that you enjoy in the shadows, while others get all of the fame and accolades. Some of these companies are in Kyoto and are seen as supporting acts for the Tokyo or Osaka main studios, but most of them are actually overseas. Japanese companies want the work these overseas companies provide, but not the negative image that many Japanese consumers have of games made by foreign companies. As a result, these names go uncredited. Now, based on everything we've seen here, I want to bring up an old video game called Sega Gaga. This is a video game about making video games. It follows a young, talented director who needs to put together a team and make a hit video game before the company goes under. It plays as a typical RPG along the lines of Earthbound. The dungeons in the game are the rooms where the developers are. You see, due to the high stress levels of gaming developers, the company locks their employees in a room to keep them from getting out. Sound familiar? The programmers start acting strange. They begin turning into monsters because they're only getting two hours of sleep per day. Your job is to go into the dungeon and insult the artists and programmers to beat them into submission and get them to work on your game. The game was being made in good fun, but it reflects a real culture that these employees often face. It's basically Sega making fun of itself and the practices prevalent within their industry. It came at the end of the Dreamcast era, so Sega was trying to make a statement about how hard the gaming industry is, what the employees go through to meet deadlines, and how tough it is to make games. Perhaps the most difficult aspect of this whole situation is how much pride salarymen take in working such long hours. If you've ever seen the Netflix documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi, you'll know what I'm talking about. It truly is inspiring to see so many people dedicate their lives to perfecting their trade, but that life is not for everyone. And the culture demands so much of people sometimes that some people just aren't able to make it. This isn't a problem unique to Japan, but it is one that Japanese society seems to have a much harder time of solving. 
Japan, having such a foothold in the video game industry, has influenced the worldwide market that has to try to compete with them. Japanese people identify heavily with their work and often, when working long hours, they're doing it of their own accord. That job is their life and they're going to put everything they have into it, just like the country's been doing for thousands of years. Thank you.